being recorded. So if you would not like to appear on screen, um, go ahead and uh, turn off your cameras. Um, and let's see, I'll turn it over to Bob if he wants to do an introduction for Dr. Masami. Well, sure. Let me make sure I'm on here. I'm on. Okay. Yeah, I, I met uh, Joe about a year ago, maybe two years ago. It seems like a while. And uh, he has uh, been one of our more popular presenters because uh, part of what he does, it's firsthand experience. You know, he's out in, the, in his own garden or one up at the research center all the time. And he's got tons of experience. He's worked around the state in several locations. And, uh, you know, he's uh, very approachable. So um, I just appreciate every time he's on. And this is one of those times. So, uh, Joe, just take it away and do what you want to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Vanessa. Glad to be here again. Um, I uh, was asked to talk about uh, let's, uh, uh, what do we do in mid-season? I guess we're not quite mid-season, but let's prepare for the mid-season. And um, so I put a collection of slides and, uh, and uh, let's go with that. All right, let me turn off the video so uh, easier for well, I don't know. Should I? Keep, I don't know. To, if, I, if I kept the video, I think I kept the video in the past. Okay, let's start over. My name is Joe Masadni, and let's talk today about the mid-season gardening activities. And the first thing I want you all to consider is that um, we are, we plant uh, we we plant throughout the year. Uh, some crops already planted and flowering, like the tomatoes, but other crops. This is a good time to plant. So uh, doing any type of tip and trick that can help improve your success uh, will favor, will favor uh, is, is in your favor. And one of them is what you see here on the left is the matted row cover. Uh, this is a very light fabric, can tear easy, but if you take care of it, it'll last for years. Um, and it's not just for uh, uh, cold temperature prote protection, you can also use it for extreme heat protection. You want to plant now, your seedling are tender, they came from the nursery or they came from the greenhouse and you put them outside, they can get sunburn. Um, so a brand name is called Agribon, A-G-R-I-B-O-N. Um, you can find them on any website, uh, Johnny's website, any other on Amazon. They're, they're great. Uh, just remember that you don't want to lay that directly on the plant. So put a, some kind of uh, wire to elevate, uh, make a hoop, make a mini tunnel, and then throw that in. And as you can see here, we put some dirt or stones or sticks, whatever to hold that in. And it's, uh, I've used it also in midsummer or for fall planting. And, and uh, it's wonderful because at that time, it also acts as a barrier against all the grasshoppers and all the cutworms and the fall armworms that are going around and they would love to eat your young seedlings. The picture here on the left is not mine, but uh, it's what I call a plausible, like a believable, uh, was sent to me. And you see here, foam cups, you cut the bottom and you use that as a barrier. So when any crawling insects cannot see the seedling or get to it and cut it or chew it. So even though I didn't do it, but when you look at it, you have the feeling that it is plump, it is believable. I also do recommend that uh, now that your tomatoes are tall enough and they have a uh, flower and uh, small flower, uh, small fruits and flowers, remove any leaves that are touching the soil, uh, even up to that first cluster. It's not going to hurt the plant, not going to hurt the fruits. This will improve any aeration, reduce any incidence of diseases like early blight or buckeye rot, anything that touches. So. Uh, sometimes like up, up to a foot of foliage I end up removing, uh, it helps a lot. Here is another way of how that matted row cover can be used. This is more popular in the fan handle where they have in the spring 50 mile an hour wind. Uh, so they wrap the tomato cages with, with that uh, to reduce that sand blasting uh, damage you, you get. Uh, and then you remove it when the wind dies, uh, the, uh, you know, this time, this time of year. 
it's open to the top and you can see the plants here are about a foot tall, foot and a half. So that does not slow their growth. It cuts down about 20, 30% of the light. That's not uh, a, a problem early in the season. All of these little tips and tricks can prepare you for a successful uh, uh, mid-season activities. Definitely irrigation is essential. Um, watering by hand is, is not a good idea. Uh, we tend to overwater. We don't know. So get a soil moisture meter, get something like $25, $30. It will last you for years. Don't get that $5 cheapy toy. And it's like putting your finger in the oven and trying to guess the temperature. Uh, you know, you can, you know, hot or cold. That's the same thing as those $5 toys. Get something $20, $25 and uh, you will uh, give you a better idea of uh, soil moisture uh, 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 content. For drip irrigation, we're luckily all the box stores nowadays um, have all the parts necessary that you see here on the bottom right. And uh, many of the uh, crew are knowledgeable on how to use them and what uh, fitting goes with what parts. Uh, but make sure that the lines are one foot apart so a four foot wide bed needs uh, three feet, uh, three lines. Four uh, lines is overkill, two lines is not good. And when I irrigate and the soil surface is moist, is dry, and you see the wet spot, that circle of the wet spot, when the two circles from the two lines touch each other, I stop watering. That's one great clue. If you like to plant a lot of herbs and small seeded crops that I suggest something like this here um, in the bottom left where you have like a sprinkler uh, because this way every day you wet that soil that one inch of soil surface uh, so that the seeds when they germinate and they have very shallow roots don't germinate and then you have two days before you water again and they dry out and wilt. So you do that every day until you start seeing the first cotyledon or uh, you know that the plant have deep roots, then you can turn that off and switch to drip irrigation. That can, uh, I know a lot of uh, gardeners who fail planting herbs and it's either one of two reasons. You, you planted them too deep uh, or you forget to keep that soil moisture, soil surface moist uh, until uh, they have developed uh, roots. And, and you know they develop roots when they when you start seeing the first true leaves on the plants. Uh, how much to irrigate? That's not easy to tell. Uh, there's not a magic recipe. I can tell you half an hour every day uh, this time and an hour every day. Uh, that's not possible. Uh, but uh, what I can tell you is that different crops require different amount of total uh, uh, water uh, volume per season. This is amount of inch, uh, you know, growers talk about inch of water and one inch means so if you cover one acre with one inch of water, that's what one inch means. So that's uh, about 56,000 56, gallons. Okay, so look at this. Uh, Cabbage need 14, now of, of course that's planting one full acre, okay? The 14 inches, uh, carrots 12. Now let's look at some uh, crop differences. Uh, to, uh, from other presentations I've given, and if you don't know, look it up, look up the definition of uh, heavy feeders. And those are the crops that need a lot of fertilizer to, be, to, to reach the maximum potential. And we know that uh, tomato, potato, pepper, onion, sweet corn are heavy feeders. And you'll notice that also are heavy water users. So look at the numbers for sweet corn, uh, onion, pepper, potato, tomato are in the 20s, uh, low to mid 20s, compared to watermelon, which is 10, almost half that amount. In the old days, watermelon was grown as dry land never irrigated, just rely on whatever rainfall you get. Well, now with irrigation, drip irrigation, growers can get more yields and they switch to that. But the tiny carrot needs as much uh, water per season as the 30 pound watermelon. That's different. And remember that water does not replace fertilizer and fertilizer does not replace water. 
If you're not fertilizing enough, don't think that adding water will make the plant grow better. You need both. You put a lot of fertilizer, you have to put a lot of water to go with that. Okay, so what am I showing you these numbers? Just to show you uh, this uh, uh, numbers here. Uh, that's, I'm, I don't wanna go too much in it. Um, this is being recorded, but it's uh, in a way to tell you, uh, give you an idea how much irrigation or a rule of thumb, one acre inch, 27,000 gallon. So for a four by eight raised bed, that's equivalent to 20 gallons per week. Okay, a regular drip irrigation you buy from the store is give you that much range in gallon per minute. You do the math, you find if you have three lines, uh, three lines, the, how many emitters they have, one foot apart, uh, that gives you then uh, you are applying 0 0.108 gallon per minute. Okay, how much minutes you need to run your irrigations to get 20 gallons per minute? You need to run it 184 minutes per week or three hours per week. So you can keep that in mind and then say, uh, here is my goal in mid-season. Early in the season when the plants are seedlings and tiny, you can cut that by third. And how you divide that by third, one hour? Do you want to do that half hour every other day, every three days, or 20 minutes every day, uh, whatever? Just tell yourself, I want to irrigate the equivalent of, let's say, 60 minutes. But, but that's as a start. Do that the first day, do, what, do it, uh, come back the next day with that soil motion meter, and then say, oops, uh, it's drying out too fast. Then I better irrigate again, even though my original plan was to irrigate water uh, half hour every third day. No, nope. I need to come back the next day and then add another 10 minutes. Uh, as the season progresses, that one hour becomes two, the, the two becomes three, and then now from now, mid-season until the end of season, minimum three hours per week. Uh, and then how you divide that three hours, definitely not one day, three hours. That's not good. Uh, you'll see if you have a raised bed that drains very well. Three hours, you'll see water coming uh, from the bottom of your raised bed. So you divide that three hours, maybe half hour every day. So that gives you the three, three and a half hours per week. Uh, okay, so they uh, play with these numbers. Uh, keep that in mind. Three hours mid-season, rest of the season, but then early one hour uh, later to switch it to two. Mid-season and rest of the season, three hours per week, and then uh, 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 so another thing I want you to be aware of is that disease control is a must, not a wait till you see the disease and then let me cure, try to cure it because uh, whatever we spray is preventative for diseases. You see an insect, you spray to kill it. So that is a curative. You see a weed, you spray it to kill it. That's curative. Diseases, uh, they are preventative. So you have to spray. I mean, I start spraying immediately after transplanting to protect it from you know, insects and diseases. And then every two weeks, um, of course, a week like this, when you have rainfall every day, I sprayed before the rainfall started. And then 10 days from now or seven days from now, when the rain slows down, I may spray again. So adjust your spray schedule anywhere between 10 to 14 days, whether you think the plants need it or not, because you are spraying a preventative treatment, not wait for the disease to happen and then try to cure it. And here's a couple of examples. Um, if you don't know your organic options and if it doesn't say clearly on it organic, here's one clue. You see the three leaves, sometimes it's a one leaf. That's a clue that it is an organic option, even though it may not say it anywhere, unless you read the label carefully. Sometimes it will say it clearly, OMRI, this is not uh, a focus, but OMRI means uh, Organic Material Research Institute. So that is uh, organic. Uh, of course, this is uh, the version of neem oil, if you've heard of it. Uh, if you have a big garden or you think you're gonna be spraying regularly, uh, spend $100 per gallon, you, it will, uh, it's cheaper per application versus buying a $10 for a, you know, a quart and then you run out and then by the time you spray the equivalent of one gallon, you have spent uh, $300.
So depending on the size of your garden and how often you spray, make a big initial investment. It will last you a lot longer and it is much cheaper per application. Insect control is also a must and spray as early as possible at the first sign of insect problem. Uh, like the first hole you see, start spraying. And here's a couple of examples of uh, Bt. Bt is a great uh, option for, uh, for worms or any larva or anything. It does not control beetles or, or sting bugs. You know, those you need something stronger like insecticidal soap. Uh, or uh, any uh, or as a directin, for example. Okay, so and for fungicide and insecticide, you can mix them together and spray at once. You don't have to make two passes. If there's a need for insecticide, uh, and ask yourself, hey, when was the last time I sprayed the fungicide? Mix them two together and spray. If you're not sure if they mix well, or uh, put do a jar test, and by a jar test. Put a little bit of water, let's say, you know, like a cup of water, put a tablespoon of one and a tablespoon of the other, shake them well, uh, stir it with a spoon and see if they gel, you know, like they form a gel and settle to the bottom, then they, these two are not compatible. Okay, and so don't mix them, don't mix spray them separately. But if you spray, if you add both and you stir them, mix them with a spoon and they don't make a gel, then they are compatible and you can spray it both at once but have a separate backpack sprayer. In case you use herbicides, have a separate backpack sprayer for herbicide. Uh, label it with a big H on it so you don't make a mistake. And then another backpack sprayer uh, for the fungicide insecticide. That's not gonna hurt if you switch from fungicide to insecticide, but no matter how well you think you cleaned your backpack from an herbicide, uh, and then you put an insecticide and spray again, there will always be a residue and you can hurt your plants. Okay. Um, one option um, starting now is to start considering a rotation. Uh, now that uh, for some crops, uh, it's towards the end of the season, you know, like, I don't know, your potatoes or some of the herbs or lettuces, things like that. Um, maybe if you don't want to plant a um, summer crop, then why don't you spread some rye grass to avoid uh, issues like nematodes? Um, you know, part of your rotation. And a trap crop, an example of trap crop are these things, is uh, where you plant one crop as a sacrificial lamb to protect the, the real crop you want to eat from. An example is with the white eggplant, you know, the white, uh, uh, look, they call them egg, egg shape. Uh, they strongly attract the beetles, the potato beetles, and those you can put then next to your tomatoes and next to your regular eggplants, even if it's in a five gallon container, they are just there as a trap. And the beetles go there and I don't know, you can cover it with a trash bag and collect all those insects, or you can spray it with seven malathion, something that you don't want to spray in your garden because you're not eating from that part eggplant, okay? Another uh, option, I'm told, but I haven't tested it yet, but it's again one of those ideas that are believable, is sunflower seeds, sunflower plants next to your tomatoes. They, the fat from the sunflower seeds and flowers attracts the sting bugs more than they attract the, uh, the fruit of the tomato. I mean, I guess, I guess sting bugs are like people. If I'm given a choice between a tomato and a bag of sunflower seeds, I'm going to go for the fat, not before I uh, nibble on the tomato. So, uh, so that's another trap crop you can uh, use if your garden space allows to plant a couple of rows of sunflowers. But make sure you plant them early enough so that by the time your tomatoes, uh, like now uh, or in a few weeks, uh, are starting to turn red, uh, your uh, sunflower already have flowers uh, starting to form flower clusters because that's the part that attracts uh, and traps the sting bugs. <clears throat> and if everything fails, if you fake them out, doesn't work, then take, take them out like this. This is a, a funny picture from a retired uh, county extension agent, great master gardener, great gardener. Uh, of course, this is just for fun, showing that uh, if uh, anything, everything else fails, then take them out. Yeah, well, that's so funny. Okay, from, so now, 
you may start seeing problems in your garden because you know you're not spraying you're not scouting you're not going to your garden regularly and trying to catch uh, problems early and then you get into a situation like this one plant is sick sh shorter than all the rest uh, immediately you got to tell yourself that cannot be a fungus or a bacteria because if it were a fung fung fungus or a bacteria one plant cannot be sick all of them will have to be sick so more than likely it's a virus transmitted by uh, insects <coughs> and 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 for a virus there's no cure so you'll see the plant shorter you see the leaves here twisted and curly and abnormal growth and development don't don't bother dig it up throw it away don't put it on the compost pile don't burn it because the virus will survive the fire and spread again uh, throw it in the trash and learn your lesson and move on plant something else and the lesson was that you should have done early season insect control like the minute you planted your sunflower your uh, tomato seedlings spray uh, neem oil spray uh, serenade spray uh, as a direct in a uh, spinosad not serenade uh, to protect them from the uh, cucumber beetles that are going around and those insects transmit viruses or it could be thrips or it could be other insect that transmit that virus <coughs> early okay now the rest of this presentation is I want to show you some uh, pictures of pests and diseases and other issues that you should know um, that you may face this time of year. Uh, and it's more like a question and answer, give you a chance to think about it uh, briefly. What is the most common reason radish fail to enlarge? Uh, is you planted them too crowded. Okay, they need about, um, I don't know, half inch, uh, inch apart. You can, you can plant them thick and thin them as they grow because young radish leaves are very tasty and they've become very popular in microgreens. So here's the one way of, um, and since the seeds don't last for many years, you buy a packet, seed the whole packet, and then thin them and you get a tiny little seed, seed here, uh, you know, root, but the leaves are even uh, just as, uh, I mean, if you like mustard greens or anything, then you should like uh, radish leaves uh, cooked. Wilted squash plants are sure sign of what pest, especially when it's uh, uh, plump and turgid and, you know, looks healthy in the morning and wilts in the afternoon. And then next morning it's healthy and then in the afternoon it wilts again. Then you have your favorite uh, squash vine border. Okay. Of course, there are some bacterial wood that's vectored uh, by the cucumber beetle, but when you have bacterial wood, it doesn't uh, get healthy in the morning and then get sick in the afternoon. What if it with bacterial wood, it gets sick and gets sicker and sicker, it continues to get uh, sicker. Okay, I'll show you a picture of uh, squash vine water later. You may see cucumber, uh, you know, curved instead of nice and straight. Uh, what causes them to be misshapen, like curled or uh, thin here and then swollen at the bottom. Can imagine like how uh, the butternut squash looks like. <clears throat> well, you have insect stings for the curve and poor pollination for that uh, gourd-like shape. That's okay, they're still edible um, um, and that's uh, nothing bad. What's the most common reason peas fail to produce? And I get images like this all the time where uh, I get an email or a picture of a six foot tall bean plant and not a single flower. Well, the reason is that you over fertilize with nitrogen. Okay, remember NPK, N is for leaves, P is for roots, and K is for fruits. So if you're growing a leafy crop, focus on your nitrogen. Okay, it doesn't mean don't put P and K, but nitrogen is essential. If you're growing any root crop or any or in any plants that's starting to develop roots, it needs the phosphorus. And K is for fruits and for overall health of the plant. So you put too much nitrogen on a uh, and there's imbalance between N and P and K, then these beans and peas that already fix their own nitrogen from the air, uh, and then you're giving them too much nitrogen, there's imbalance. 
and they fail to produce because now the P and K are much low compared to the nitrogen that you gave it. So be uh, uh, whatever you fertilize your squash and cucumber and all this, uh, give the beans half that amount. And whatever you fertilize your squash and cucumber, you know, the average plants, give them double that amount for your uh, uh, heavy feeders that I talked about earlier. Let me re recap and tell you that the heavy feeders are your potato, your, your um, corn, your tomato, pepper, eggplant, onion. Those are heavy feeders. So let's say you get a label and for tomato fertilizer, and I tell you a tablespoon per gallon, then put half tablespoon for the rest of the vegetable crops per gallon and then even half that amount for your beans and peas, okay? Because they fix their own. <clears throat> okay, the, uh, what's the better time to plant a cauliflower this time of year or in the summer for a fall crop? Uh, you better plant it in the fall because as the temperature get cooler and cooler, your head uh, gets a chance to get bigger and bigger and uh, uh, bigger size. And if you really want the whitest white of that cauliflower, <clears throat> you have to grab those leaves, the center leaves, and bundle them together and you know, use a rubber band. Uh, here in this picture, those leaves were cut just to show you how beautiful uh, white it is. If you don't, then it turns uh, like um, enamel color, like, uh, I don't know, ivory color, uh, which is edible, uh, just that. Uh, commercially in the stores, you want the whitest white uh, cauliflower. And that's a trick to do it is wrap those leaves and, uh, uh, and tie them with a rubber band so that cauliflower does not see uh, the light of day. Uh, if you see trails and leaves, these are your uh, leaf miners. Um, there's no insecticide that you can spray one because it's inside the leaf. Um, you can spray something for the moth, that's the adult flying and laying eggs around, but then ask yourself again, is it worth spraying or not? Like just looking at this picture, you can tell that these are not young plants, they're not uh, seedlings, they're towards the end of the season, season. Uh, two, or, two or three insects per leaf, it's not worth spraying. Uh, just uh, if you're done harvesting, dig up those plants and, and uh, start, start uh, another crop. If you see one or two holes or trails per leaf and the plants is only two or three weeks old in the, in, in the garden, that is a heavy infestation and you've got to spray something. And again, you're spraying something that will hopefully kill the moth because you cannot spray unless you want to switch to non-organic options. Sometimes your eggplant and your cucumbers are bitter well, because they got stressed, most likely uh, lack of uh, irrigation because too hot or too cold, is, when they start flowering, too cold is not possible in Texas. Uh, uh, by the time you start having cucumber eggplant, it, you can, you're not going to have too cold weather. So you forgot to irrigate them. Uh, uh, you eat a cucumber, it's bitter. Uh, it's not a wasted a waste. You can make pickles from it because uh, uh, eggplants, um, you can uh, cut it like you see here, put a lot of salt on it, same thing for cucumber, and then leave that for 10-15 minutes and then that salt will fix, will re clean the bitterness. I, I don't know if it's removing or reacting with the bitterness, but that seems to help. And then you can cook, uh, wash this excess salt off and then cook them and it'll be fine. Um, you, you may see this early uh, this time of year when um, uh, plants starting to flower, you see, started to, uh, and then, uh, you know, starting to set and then boom, it crashes. Well, that's because uh, poor pollination. Uh, and by the way, if you don't know your squash flower, male from female, this here is a male flower. You see the stem under the flower is a straight stem. Whereas this is, of course, is a female flower. This is a female flower because even uh, the flower here hasn't opened yet, but you already see a tiny baby uh, squash. Even this is a female flower because you see, you already see the sign of uh, um, the shape of a tiny squash there. 
where if it's a male flower like this one or like this one, you see a straight stem. And of course, don't worry if you first see a lot of male flowers, this is normal. The plants gives a lot of male flowers and then starts uh, making the female flowers. So this happened, nothing you can do about it. It just happened that when this flower was open and ready for pollination, it must have been rainy day or any couple of days or whatever. Okay, what best control product, best control worms on cabbages and any other vegetable? I mentioned that earlier and I showed it to you, showed you a couple of products. It is BT. You are spraying a bacteria to kill the insect. BT is your friend, okay? But it only can control worms, uh, not the adult beetles, not the cucumber beetles, not anything that's crawling on legs, you know, as, uh, you know, grasshoppers or anything like that. And these are a couple of pictures I was sent recently and I circled where the worms were, are, that I, and, and I stopped counting. I'm sure there are more if you look closely. What can you do at this stage? You, you can spray, uh, you can spray BT and kill what's there, but they already laid eggs and there are more eggs to hatch and the plant is defoliated. I mean, they ate all the leaves. The, the damage is done. You lost that war to those worms, spray them to kill them so they don't move to another plant and then dig those up and throw them away. If you have to wait to... <laughs> I have that joke always. Uh, if you have to wait to this stage before you do something, find another hobby, please. You are terrible at gardening. Have mercy on yourself and find another hobby. Go for a walk. Okay. Uh, the best advice I tell everybody is that your shadow is the best key to success. And what does that mean? Meaning you are being present in the garden all the time, scouting, looking at things, catching uh, the problems early, seeing the first nibble on the first leaf, and then look where that worm is, grab it, crush it. If you don't want to spray, only see a couple of holes, spray up and down and everywhere to get rid of them. You, if you do this regularly, scouting, walking around your garden, you will, this will ne should never happen to you. Okay, let's switch on uh, to the topic of interplanting. Is there any value to interplanting? It's been done for thousands of years of generations in every developing country because let's say a family of 10 had the one acre or half an acre of land and they got to feed themselves and so they used every square inch so you see you know of course the trick is to plant something that's uh, finishes quick like the lettuces next to the beans that may take a long time or next to a squash that uh, takes a long time. So by the time the squash or the beans or the tomatoes start to fill up, and, and then you, you already harvested some of the uh, lettuce and the, or the radish or spinach or whatever, that's early season, okay? Um, if you buy uh, hybrid tomatoes, you may start seeing uh, names, letters next to the name, and what do those letters mean? V, F, N, and now there's T and A. They describe what disease resistant is added to that tomato through normal breeding techniques, not traditional breeding techniques, not GMO. So don't worry that this hybrid is a GMO, no. So if you have serious nematode issue in your garden, well, maybe it's time to dig up that dirt, that potting mix or whatever you compost you have in your raised bed. That's a serious problem, dig it up, throw it away and refill. But if it's a minor issue, then buy a tomato variety, hybrid variety that has the letter N next to it because that plant is naturally resistant to nematode. V for Verticillium wilt, F for Fusarium, T for viruses and A for anthracnose. So get to know what those diseases and insect problems are uh, and uh, I mean nematode problems are and, and this way you learn to combat them. Um, you, uh, greening of potatoes is caused by exposure to sunlight that uh, they, you may read that it's toxic. Uh, well, yeah, if you eat a ton of it, uh, so don't worry, don't throw that away, fry it, cook it, whatever, uh, that tiny amount that's from that green is not gonna cause, cause serious health issues uh, from that tiny amount. But hey, if you're gonna worry about it, discard it and uh, make sure you 
you add more dirt when you grow in potatoes, what we call hilling. Uh, so it does not, uh, so the potatoes that form and the roots uh, do not get exposed to sunlight. This is a serious problem insect. And I mentioned it a couple of times, Iru, and it's one of the first insects you see in the garden. And I want you to, the minute you plant, spray even before you see it, because it's there. It survived the, the winter storm and the ice storm we had. So it loves, and that, and it, more than the damage that it does by feeding, it causes more uh, damage by spreading viruses and diseases. Okay. Uh, mid season, you may start seeing the flower abortion from your tomato plants and possible causes are weather, the variety doesn't like the heat, you fertilize too much, poor pollination, insect, you know, insect came and cut it here, that's possible. So the answer is all the above. Uh, okay, so switch to another variety that's heat tolerant. You can plant tomatoes this time of year if you choose something like uh, heat wave or sunset or sun jet, anything with those keywords, heat or sun or whatever in the description, they tell you that it's uh, heat tolerant. And this is the problem that uh, we mentioned earlier about the squash vine border. This is the squash vine border that uh, 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 eats, eats it from the inside out. And uh, at this stage, there's nothing you can do to spray nothing you can spray that will go inside and get it. So you have to learn how to catch it before it gets to the stage. And the best advice I can tell you is that uh, read everything you can and uh, look at all the pictures so you can ID them uh, even at the worm stage uh, or even better at the X stage. So again, your shadow, you scouting the garden all the time when you start seeing the first flowers on those squash vine, even before it opens, you don't wait till it, it's open and fully open, but even before that, when your tiny little flowers start to develop, start flipping all the leaves, look on the bottom side, and if you see a cluster of brown eggs, this is the best time to crush them with your finger, the best organic option. You did not have to spray anything, because if these hatch, they're immediately going to make a, what do you call it, beeline towards the crawl, towards the stem, close to the soil surface, and enter from there and then good luck trying to get them. These are white grubs that are more popular in the turf. And this is how the adult looks like. You can apply, you know, some insecticide, uh, some, some organic options are available, but those are, I mean, you can apply seven, melophine, uh, it's in the turf, you're not eating from that if you are not exposed against it. You want still organic option, then you can, so there's a product called Milky Spore, Biosafe, Biovector, those are options that you can spray and uh, will kill the worm stage. Once they germinate, uh, hatch, I'm sorry, uh, there's nothing you can spray to, to get them. This is a serious problem and um, not just tomato and many vegetable crop, which is a Fusarium wilt, which is a bacteria. Um, and the uh, only way to tell is uh, you with a pocket knife peel the stem and you see that the tissue inside, instead of being nice and green and white, uh, uh, you know, colors, it's uh, brownish and rotting. And so basically it's the, this the bacteria is killing, disrupting uh, the flow of water and the plants uh, wilts and there's no recovery. These here on the left, what are they called? If you don't know by now, one day you will get them. It seems like whenever I plant peas in the fall, beans, uh, it's like they come with the seed. Well, now I'm realizing that maybe the ants are bringing them in because ants are ranchers uh, to the aphids like we ranch our cattle. They move them from one plant to another because they, you see here, it's sucking that uh, dew drops that uh, the aphid uh, secretes from its tail. Uh, okay, uh, so they protect them from other ant colonies, and if they are not give, getting enough juice, they pluck it gently and move it to another uh, new growth of the leaf. And aphids are a serious problem because this mama aphid does not lay eggs, but it uh, gives birth to live pregnant females. So all of these are just, you know, given birth from this mama aphid and they already pregnant waiting to 
pre-pregnant. They're just waiting to develop to make to get big size big enough to start uh, giving birth to more pregnant babies. So when you spray for aphids, uh, you gotta spray, and then three days later come spray again because even if you uh, leave ten percent of the aphids, uh, uh, you know, escape the first spray, that ten percent in a week they uh, become a serious population number. So one clue that you have aphids, uh, because they're small, they're not easy to see, is first they are clustered on the youngest uh, shoot, the tip of the plants. But another clue is that if you see ants going up and down your plants, ants have no business uh, to be on the plants, unless they are leaf cutter ants, but those we don't have here. So if you see ants going around any of your, on, on your plants, then they're looking for aphids, or they are bringing aphids, or they are feeding off aphids. So that's your clue if you have aphids is to look for ants. This is a serious problem. Uh, and if you reach this stage, uh, might as well dig up that uh, crop and throw it away because you, you should have sprayed long time ago. Even on a commercial operation where they have curative options, uh, this stage is too, too late. Downy mildew, look up everything you know about, you can about downy mildew. Uh, and uh, learn what options available and how to ID it at early stages. Tomato cracking, uh, whether circular or radial, uh, the best way you can do it is just add uh, mulch and more uniform uh, watering uh, so that uh, mulch to, pr to preserve the soil moisture, okay, so that the soil doesn't dry out quick. And instead of watering every three days uh, for a total of three hours, maybe half hour a day. That's what I mean, more uniform watering. Because what happened is that the skin of the tomato, if it's stressed, like it dries uh, from, uh, you know, moisture stress, like not enough water, it dries up and it becomes like a solid box. Well, you irrigate next time, well, that tomato cannot, the skin cannot expand anymore because it dried and you keep pumping more water in, it breaks you break it like it pops like a balloon bursting. That is what. So if you see this, uh, your irrigation is not uh, uniform. Um, you know, it sometimes can be from cold injury if it's really early in the season. But we don't, again, we don't have serious cold temperature uh, when the fruits are, you know, in June, for example, or late May. This is the uh, corn earworm which is the same thing as the tomato fruit worm. It's the same worm, it's just a different name because of the different crop. Uh, and it's only a serious problem uh, when it's at the silking stage, when the silt is green. Before the silt is shown, you really don't have to spray. After the silt dries out, you really don't have to spray. You're wasting your time and money. But uh, BT is an option or seven, which is, you know, non-organic is a great option to get rid of this corn ear. Okay, uh, this is a root knot nematode. That's how they look when you dig up a plant at the end of the season, root knot nematode. And uh, here is what a healthy tomato root should look like compared to a nematode infested root system. So what I suggest, the minute you dig up your, la you harvest your last tomato fruit, dig up your tomato immediately, plant, and look at the roots, see if you have something like this or you have something like that. Because if you, uh, after you harvest that last fruit, uh, that tomato is a weed. It's not feeding you, but it's still feeding the worms, it's still feeding the insects, it's still feeding the diseases, and next year your problem is worse. After the last fruit is harvested, um, they dig up that plant. And if you have something like this, then uh, there is a product called Syncosin. And I'll type it when I finish in the chat box. I'll have to spell it. It's an organic option. I've had good uh, uh, trial with it. I'm happy with it. Of course, if it's a serious, serious infestation, uh, nothing you can spray. Where you may kill some of them, but uh, it may be many years before you kill all of them. So like I said, if you spray once or twice and uh, no success, uh, don't uh, be the eternal optimist, oh, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. Dig up that soil, throw it away, uh, so refill your be raised beds with new compost and uh, enjoy gardening. This uh, powdery mildew, 
unlike downy mildew, looks like someone sprinkled uh, baby powder on your plants. Um, you know, there's uh, lots of organic options, uh, sulfur, uh, neem oil, potassium bicarbonate, you know, Caligreen, first step. Uh, and uh, uh, let me go back here. Powdery mildew uh, is a problem in a very dry year, like it doesn't rain for a month. So this year, with all the rain we're having, you'll never see powdery mildew. But you're at risk of seeing downy mildew. So if it's either one or the other, too much rain or even regular rainfall with high humidity, downy mildew, uh, dry weather, not enough rainfall, then it's powdery mildew. But powdery mildew is much easier to control than uh, downy mildew. And here's some uh, homeowner options. You may plant the green or yellow zucchini or squash, and then they come out like this. Well, this is a virus. Uh, insect transmitted, so the insect bit here, bit here, stung here, stung here, and just put the virus. This is, these are really um, uh, cosmetic, but not going to affect the taste, not going to do anything. I mean, if you're courageous enough, all these are edible. Uh, it's just they're um, yeah, not sellable. If you're a commercial operation, this is not going to sell. But uh, you're a homeowner, just uh, uh, tell yourself, hey, I'm growing wild and crazy squash. Uh, it's still edible and tastes just as good. But uh, if you want, if you don't want this, then you should have sprayed something for the insects or for the aphids early in the season. Okay. This uh, is another problem of uh, tomatoes that I want you to learn everything you can about it uh, because it is common and it will be here every year, every year after year, and it's called early blight. Uh, and uh, here are three pictures I downloaded from sister universities uh, uh, just to show you that the symptoms may vary. Uh, don't look at this picture and say, okay, this is how early blight should look like. No, depending on how early or how late, uh, it uh, can look uh, different, different. So, but you, with time, you'll learn, like here are early uh, symptoms uh, and then when they get bigger you start seeing circles inside and you start seeing more yellowing uh, around the edge of it uh, and of course eventually uh, when it's really serious the whole plant will crash and start so to wilt. so early mid late stages get to know everything about early blight and get to know all the options uh, available for you to spray even if it's sulfur, even if it's neem oil, regular spray, even if it's, um, you know, serenade, all those are great options with regular sprays, like I said, 10 to 14 day cycle. Which one is your friend and which one is your enemy? Well, this is your friend here on the bottom right, which is the lady beetle. And these are your striped or your spotted uh, cucumber beetle. Okay. Uh, and uh, what is this pest many gardeners consider the most damaging to tomatoes? It's this little tiny dot here at the tip of your pencil. That's how small the mites are. And here are more pictures of mites, again, downloaded, uh, copied from the internet. Um, so you see um, you have like a silver shine to the leaves. When you look closely, if you see this stage where you see web, and all these spider here, again, find another hobby. Mites are mites, they're spiders, by the way. They're not insects. So don't spray an insecticide, uh, you're not gonna kill them. You have to spray a miticide, specific pro product. Neem oil will work because it's oil, it kills everything by suffocation. Okay, um, okay, but uh, maybe even insecticidal soap, even though it's called insecticidal because that works by suffocation. Um, but again, again, see here different pictures. Uh, so learn, like here's early on top left, and here's serious close up when it's severe and you start seeing webbing, and here's a severe late season with heavy infestation, uh, when even the plant starts uh, losing uh, losing color, fading, and crashing. And of course, they can they can even and will feed on the fruits. So when you see the spots here like that, that you know that you had your spider mites. And this is um, your, your friend, the squash bug. I hope it's not your friend. And uh, remember, most people uh, catch it at this stage. 
and good luck trying to spray anything to kill it, even non-organic options. You have to scout again, scout and scout to catch them early so that if they are at this stage or at this stage, uh, they can be killed even by insecticidal soap. If you wait till they are this stage and there's three of them per, per fruit, good luck. This is your uh, potato beetle. Uh, and finally, in the last few minutes, I want to remind you that visit Aggie Horticulture. This is a screenshot of Aggie Horticulture webpage. I'm responsible for these two sections. And the vegetable resources, and uh, you, there is a vegetable problem solver. There's also a lot of fact sheets for the homeowner and more detail and more uh, guides for the commercial. So read this and then read this, even though you're not commercial, there's just more detail. But in the vegetable problem solver, when you click here, here's an example of, I mean, we have for cucurbits and tomato, for the cucurbit, for the tomato, uh, we have different pictures. So it's a great guide to see, here's my picture. Does it look like this? Here's my plant. Does it look like this or does it look like that? If it looks like this, then you click here on early blight and gives you a little description of what it is and what you can do. So it's just a guide that does not, it's not an encyclopedia of diseases and what to do with them. It's just a start, okay? In the homeowner section, I have lots of easy gardening uh, publication for various crops and some publications uh, on specific topics like this one on tomato, like this one on what makes tomato leaves twist and curl, um, if, um, something bigger like 20 pages on uh, vegetable gardening guide. Now, and the other one I'm responsible for is the small acreage horticulture crops, which is a collection of webinars, something like this, an online course that I recorded. So when you click there and you click here on the recorded webinars here, and here's a screenshot of some of the past topics I've presented, eggshells, home remedies, hugel culture, growing vegetables in containers, Okay, each, each of these is about an hour. And then when you take it, you, you're asked to fill a quick survey on what you learned, if you like it, things like that. So between these two, if you read everything and you learn everything and learn these, I'm sure your gardening skill will be A-okay, A+. -plus. With that, thank you very much for your attention. And I stop sharing so I can see the chat. Okay, before I forget, let me type the name of that Cinco, is it S-I-N or, I'm sorry, Cinco Sin. It's, it's one of those two spelling. Those are the two product, uh, that, uh, for nematode, uh, organic option spray nematodes. Um, and, um, uh, but I'm sorry, I forgot the spelling. Thank you so much, Dr. Masami. I know we had some questions early on in the chat. Um, someone was uh, asking about how to get rid of Asian jasmine ground cover. If there's anything you could, uh, any way besides pulling it by hand, which is what they're currently doing. <laughs> Asian, what is it called? Asian jasmine. It's a, one of the ground covers. Oh, well, if you don't want to plant um, for uh, a whole summer, like if you can afford, uh, put a, a cardboard and start with for light for a, for a long time. Uh, like maybe even, even in the fall, start in the fall until spring. Uh, solid cardboard, start with for light. Uh, then it'll come back very weak. Uh, of course, uh, maybe you have to repeat that again more than one time. Uh, that will be the best option. Of course, Roundup uh, will do it, uh, but uh, will not become very popular. Right. So those are a couple <laughs> ideas. Um, and so someone else asked about getting rid of poison ivy uh, and would vinegar kill it? Um, no, no. No, okay. <laughs> if it's an uh, area where, again, you need to do conventional uh, products. If it's area way out of the garden, around the fence, uh, away from your place you eat. Uh, there are products even stronger than Roundup uh, that the railroad industry uses to spray the railroads and, and that will can, uh, what you spray can last for a year. Uh, so you have to go to those farm stores and tell them I want something that to get uh, 
uh, you know, what the railroad company use and uh, use it. And of course, please, even with organic products, uh, read the label, uh, follow the instructions. Uh, if it tells you wear a mask, wear gloves, wear long sleeve shirts, whatever it tells you, please follow it uh, and uh, it should be okay. All right. I'm sorry, I missed the part where um, she said that it's growing in her hedges. So is, is there anything that is it just, would just be physical removal, I guess, if it's growing through something you don't want? Yeah. You, usually poison ivy is found on hedges and things like that, or like on fences or around trees, you know, because it comes from the bird droppings. The bird lands on the fence or in the hedge. You just have to spray something strong, even stronger than Roundup, and go to a uh, Go to your uh, uh, farm uh, store, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call them? Farm and feed store. And they some some of them uh, sell these uh, products. Tell them I want something for poison ivy uh, around the hedges. But again, remember, that's not labeled for the vegetable garden or field crop. It's labeled for uh, non-crop uh, areas. All right. I know the, be the best way to get rid of poison ivy is to have some goats, but they will eat everything in your yard, though, not just the oh, poison ivy. Of course, of course, <laughs> yes. Um, so I think you answered this question already during your presentation about um, using a fertilizer that is lower in nitrogen to get plants to put their energy into fruiting. So I yes. think you answered that during your presentation that, yes, you want to lower nitrogen if you want fruiting versus um, having uh, the potassium in the... Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and someone had a good reminder to not use chemicals, uh, spray chemicals while it's raining because they'll just wash off. So yes, absolutely. So, so absolutely. put a good reminder in there. Like so right now, this, this week is not a good week to spray. <laughs> don't, don't spray now. Now, if you know it's going to rain tomorrow and you have to spray a fungicide, spray the day before. At least, at least two, three hours for that product to dry out on the foliage is, is best. But 24 hours is even better, even though it's going to rain. Uh, but uh, uh, most of it is absorbed and did it, its magic on in the plant or on the plant, and it should be safe. That's what commercial growers do. Uh, homeowners, if it's going to rain, don't spray. Uh, I, I agree the risk of uh, storm water and risk of things is higher for the homeowner because homeowners always tend to spray a little bit more. If it, the label tells you a teaspoon per gallon, they think that teaspoon and a half is even better. And that's what we want to avoid. All right. Um, and someone asked about composting dog poop to use as a fertilizer, and several people in the chat put, do not do that. <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I mean, in theory, if you know how to do composting, uh, professional companies where they have active uh, composting with steam, it can be used. Even human waste can be used there but you have to be specialized and test afterward to make sure E. coli and all those uh, salmonella is absent. A homeowner, don't do it. The risk is too high. All right. Um, and someone had a question about when you're showing the, the pictures of the worms on the plant. Um, I guess maybe they were having a problem. Are those normally those worms visible to the eye? Oh yeah, oh yeah, they're okay. big. They're like an inch long. I mean, okay. I can, um, here, let me see if I have that picture. And I can share the screen again if it loads. Let's see. Okay, let's share the screen again. You see the screen? Uh, not yet. Oh. Is it showing? No, I, I still, uh, now it's showing, yes. Okay, you see this? Uh, oh, you wait, see it? Oh, wait, no, it's, it's it switched it switched briefly and then it, it's gone now again <laughs> oh sorry what's the problem <laughs> i'm not sure it is showing that i'm sharing screen too um i don't can can you see it bob i'm not seeing it on my end at least no i don't see it okay okay let yeah, me... i don't I don't see oh. you sharing either. Oh, now I do. There we go. Oh, yeah. Now oh, we can see it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you see it? So here's the plant, and here's zooming in. Look. One, two, three, ah. four, five, six, seven, <laughs> eight, nine, ten, eleven. You stop counting. 
11, 12, 13. Um, and look what it's done. It's eating, it's eating the whole leaf. And now it's starting to eat the stem of the leaf. And uh, I, I mean, what is this? Are you growing? This, this, and this gardener should learn fishing because this is a great time to catch all these worms and go fishing with them. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry. sorry and, and the, the person that asked that question asked, do they eat uh, ornamental plants as well? Uh, those types of particular worms? Uh, I am not an ornamental, so I cannot uh, venture. I don't know. I've never seen my roses uh, fed, uh, you know, something like that, worm feeding on them. But again, I don't know. Uh, herbaceous ornamentals, uh, sure, why not? But uh, woody ornamentals, I've never seen anything like that on them. So, okay. But uh, I'll leave that uh, to the expert on ornamental to, to answer. So they probably more likely be attacking your annuals versus your perennials. Yeah, your annual herbaceous, you know, by herbaceous means like your annuals, something, uh, all those ornamentals that don't film, don't form, uh, don't make woody uh, stems, woody structures. All right. Um, let's see. Um, and you talked about insecticidal soap. And so uh, if someone asks us how helpful that is in the garden, it sounds like it oh. has a lot of different applications. Absolutely, very helpful, very helpful. I was talking to a 90 year old lady a few years ago and asked her, what did you, when you were young, when you were a kid, what did you remember your parents and grandparents using uh, in their garden? Because if she's 90, that's, I mean, I'm asking her to, to remind me of something what they did in the 1890s or the, you know, early, so before chemical pesticides became popular, and she said they used to collect, uh, you know, before, and even before plumbing, indoor plumbing, they used to collect the water uh, from the sink, you know, bucket under the sink, soapy water, and spread it in the garden, spray it in the garden. Well, that's insecticidal soap, soap and oil. Um, you mix it together and you spray your garden. Now, don't try to make your own recipe. See a YouTube video and this, uh, I did this, I did that. Uh, because, you know, those are scary recipe. If you want to try it, try on one plant. In case you burn that plant, you kill only one, uh, not kill the whole garden. Um, but best is uh, buy a pre-formulated product. And this way, you know, you're never going to kill any plant. Oh, right. Is it helpful? Absolutely. It is one of the products you should always have on hand. Insecticidal soap, Bt, and something stronger for other insects than Bt, like uh, like uh, uh, spinosad. Okay, those three should, you should have in your arsenal, and use them as you see needed. All right. And this is a question I have. It's not one someone <laughs> asked um, for the corn silkworms. Um, yeah. I read a while back that it, obviously the, for commercial production, this would not be practical, but putting a drop of mineral oil at the top um, helps control those. I'm not sure if you ever come across that before, if that's just like a, a failed home remedy. <laughs> Uh, yes, that can that can work because the or even something stinkier, uh, so that the worm does not enter from there and go inside. Uh, it's believable. I've never tried it, but again, one of those things that you'll say, sure, yeah, that's a bit is believable. All right. <laughs> Uh, I think that was all the questions we have. Is, is there any advice you have with all this rain we've been getting? Any anything after we get finished with all this rain? Should we spray anything in particular to prevent the fungus? Or immediately spray a fungicide or two. Uh, you know, immediately spray a fungicide. Scout your garden. See which one is wilting. Which one where the water standing that has not drained out quickly, and decide if you want to dig that plant. Uh, see, uh, with all this rain, you're gonna have a flush of insects coming next few days. So uh, decide if you wanna spray an insecticide. Yes, remember your shadow is the key to success. Start scouting and decide what's the weather. In fungicide, insecticide, uh, time to put a fertilizer, a balanced fertilizer, uh, because that rainfall must have washed, could have washed out a lot of the nitrogen away from the roots. Uh, so time to give it um, a, a new dose of uh, fish emulsion or any product that you like to use. All right, um, and are, are you familiar um, with the, I think they're asking about um, Howard Garrett, um, it's a Dr. Dirt, but I think they're talking about Howard Garrett makes a spray out of hot peppers and garlic. Is that effective at all for any kind of pest control? Um, I've never tried them, honestly. I mean, I don't see why they don't work. Uh, I haven't tried them, so I'd be happy to hear from someone who tried it, let me know. 
Okay. Um, uh, have to work. But any of these, remember any of the organic products uh, in general for any product, the earlier you spray it, the younger the small, the younger the worm or the insect or this, the higher the chance it will uh, work. If you want to wait till you have adult sting bug and there's 10 of them on your tomato, you can spray it with napalm and it's not going to work. But you want to use garlic slash uh, pepper or whatever other pro organic products, then spray the eggs. The minute the eggs hatch, that's when uh, uh, the earlier, the better. Yes. And someone mentioned that the worms were uh, uh, camouflage well, unless you look closely. So I guess you're talking about inspecting your plants. It's, it's best to inspect them. Inspect your plants. <laughs> Close leaves, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I find um, for anybody who has problems with tomato hornworms that the evening time they come out, it's the easiest time to find them is in the evening. <laughs> and BT works great on them. Because even though, because that's a big worm, that's a, you know, it's a worm. No matter how big it is, the BT <laughs> will work. Yes, and I actually saw a wasp once trying to carry one off and I was like, yay wasps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. I didn't know wasps ate those, but I guess he was hungry enough. It will eat. Take those to, yeah. uh, I guess they actually feed them to their larvae, but yeah. it, was, now, it was fascinating. <laughs> in case you see a tomato hornworm with white uh, little cylinders on its body, leave it because those are uh, parasite, uh, insect, insect parasite uh, that laid its eggs on it. That worm is not feeding. Uh, so you want more of those eggs to hatch so you can have more beneficial insects out there uh, eating on more insects. So if you see a, a tomato hornworm with a lot of white egg sacs, uh, you know, they look like little um, barrels, white barrels on its body, leave it. Those are your friends. All right. Well, I guess I you can was... search online and see a video of uh, search for uh, tomato hornworm parasite and you'll see all insects. Very cool. I'm, I'm glad to know nature's helping us out somewhat yeah. <laughs> against all the, all the things that like to eat our, our, our tasty vegetables. All right, I think that was all of the questions that we had in the chat. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Masami, for spending your time with us today um, and giving all the great advice. I know I need to do a closer inspection of my plants, especially with all this rain. Um, yeah. I was telling Bob before we started that my plants are really growing too much, too close together. They've gotten a little bit too wild. I need to thin them out some because that will um, not help with the fungus situation because anytime you have <laughs> your plants too crowded, I've learned you definitely to get fungus more when they're crowded yes. like that they don't get the air movement through them so <laughs> glad right. to be here well, always a so pleasure much, everyone. i hope you all enjoyed it and <laughs> thanks for the invitation yes thank you, thank you so much Joe. appreciate you um so we're gonna take a two-week break but we'll be back on june 7th um with the top 10 um gardens you can public gardens you can see across the state um so you know if you're thinking of a nice safe vacation to go on <laughs> the summer i mean all these gardens are outdoors so and you can get some ideas maybe for what you want to grow in your garden i think it's a mix of ornamental and vegetable gardens too so you can get some great ideas thank you bye-bye right, thank you